Sorry that I only got two videos out for that month because I was actually gonna do one more video before Spiral Month ended, but at, but after I finished recording the my my voiceover for the Enter the Dragonfly video, I actually caught a I actually caught a cold, so my nose was stuffy, my throat was all scratchy. At one point, it just got so bad to the point where I just couldn't do anything about like my schoolwork. Then the, the Enter the Dragonfly video, nothing. Like I just wanted I just wanted to get some rest at that point. But uh, yeah, um, but I couldn't do any, but I, but I couldn't do any more voiceovers at at that point either because I would just sound like really nasally. I would just sound like a, a, a guy version of Lois Griffin. So yeah, uh, I'm feeling better now, and I'm ready to do this video because it's actually my favorite game, the original uh, Sucker Punch Sly trilogy. So Sly Three actually doesn't have as much of a story for its development like the last two games, mainly because they only had 11 months to ship this game when they had three years to make Sly One and two years to make Sly Two. There's also not any behind the scenes videos for this game either, but here's what I can piece together. So after the overwhelming success of Sly 2, Sucker Punch immediately started working on the sequel, and like I said, they only had a year to develop this game. And while that might sound pretty bad, but since they already had all the assets set up from the last game, Sucker Punch just decided if it wasn't broke then don't fix it, and just tried improving their graphical presentation, other gameplay mechanics that need some tweaking, and also have some multiplayer elements, new characters, vehicles, mini games, more developed combat, and have missions be replayable, which wasn't in the last game. When the game was first coming out, it had these 3D glasses, and each copy of this game had one, but it was optional, so you could play the sections that had 3D without the glasses. It's also important to note that after Sly 2 came out, Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank already finished up their trilogies, and those franchises were just putting out spin-offs at the time, and people were starting to know Sly as another PlayStation mascot, so eyes are all on Sly, Bentley, and Murray to go out with a bang. <laughs> What's your role? Sly 3. Rated everyone 10 and older. So I guess that's why this game only had a year in development. So normally crunching a group of developers for time to get a game released for a deadline is never a good thing. You want an example? Look at Enter the Dragonfly. But Sucker Punch was confident in their choices because Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves was released on September 26, 2005. You know, it's kind of funny to me how like all three of these franchises have like th two or more years to make their first and second games but only had one year to make their third game, and with Jack 3, that meant just being like a disappointing end to the trilogy just because it didn't have a lot of time to like flush out all the stuff that it had planned. And with Ratchet and Clank 3, like, I mean, like in my opinion, I felt like it was still a pretty fun, it was still a pretty fun game to fix all the problems that people had with its predecessors, so um, does Sly 3 fall in the first example? The second? Somewhere in between? So when Sly 3 first came out, it didn't get as much praise as Sly 2, but it was on equal rounds with it. But even then, someone at Metacritic did call it the best Sly game and the 20th best PS2 game. And some reviews do acknowledge some of the improvements that 3 made from 2. Now among the Sly community, it's pretty split between whether Sly 2 or Sly 3 is the best game in the series, it was Sly, what mo most people are saying that Sly 2 is. But if you're asking me, I'm more on the side of liking Sly 3 more than Sly 2. I, I, pers I usually don't share my overall thoughts about a game until the end of the video, but I'm just going to say this right now. Sly 3 is definitely my favorite game in the entire series between the four games. Like, I even replay the entire trilogy all over again just to know what I'm talking about here. And I just feel like Sly, I just feel like Honor Among Thieves just like took what I didn't like about Band of Thieves, whether, whether it was like gameplay or story, and just made it even better for me to just put it above at all the, the rest of the games. Like, back then, I probably would have, I probably would have put Sly 3 as second, right, right next to Sly 1. But with the mindset that I have now, I feel like there's a lot. Of, I, I feel like there's a lot about Sly 3 that that I really appreciate now. So I wasn't as obsessed with Sly 3 as I was with Sly 1, but I have just as many memories with Honor Among Thieves though. I feel like I can quote this game the most out of any game in the entire series, something that I remember very vividly on my first playthrough back in 2013. But I'll get into that more the later we get into the game because we have a story to summarize. And again, just like the last game, this game is definitely not a good starting point if you want to know the story about Sly. And again, this is all gonna be from a from a casual point of view, or or at least as a, as casual as I can make it here. So like, I'm not gonna like dive into all the extensive lore into this game. So this is all this is all just from 
is all just from my perspective. So I'll try, I'll try to make the summary a little shorter than slide two, but I can't but I can't really make any promises here. So yeah, but now things are getting interesting as we get into the story of slide three, Honor Among Thieves. <laughs> So like in Slide 2, there is a prequel comic to this game that came out right before the game released, but unlike in Slide 2, the events of this comic actually tie into the events of Slide 3. Why don't you just skip the first comic and play the second game no problem? To understand the overall story of Slide 3, you need to read this comic. It starts off with Sly visiting a prison and meeting someone named McSweeney, a man who was with his father's old gang. He gives him the details about a family secret called the Cooper Vault, where the Cooper family kept all their old treasure over the generations. We then come out to Sly and Murray who are on their own, and they break into the hospital to get Ben Lee, who is still recovering from getting paralyzed at the end of Sly 2. Sly tells Ben Lee that despite his legs not working, he's, he's just as valuable on the team as Sly and Murray. But a bunch of guards walk into the room, and Murray suddenly starts to remember that he's the Murray, and starts knocking these guys out so Sly and Ben Lee can escape. Then we see Carmelia looking at the security footage, and it's here where we find out just how hopeless those two are without Ben Lee, since they're knocking shit over, breaking shit, and just tripping over everything. There's also this guy who Carmelita works with and is trying to get with her, and she just kind of orders her around like he's nothing. It's honestly kind of sad because he can't even get a single warden with her. And anyway, she also has a map to the Cooper Bowl hoping that Sly would come for it, and when he does, she used the opportunity to try to arrest him, and Sly took all of her bullets while she was sleeping, and when she tells him about the secret bullet that she has, he just tells her, maybe I like watching you sleep, or even if that is a clip, that's just one of the creepy things that should never be said to a girl or anyone in general. I mean, honestly, I'm kind of surprised that she doesn't say anything about Carmelia without her jacket because it's the only time we see her like this. But I think we all know one website that's going to have a fuel day with this image. And with the last part of the comic shows Benley fixing up his new wheelchair with a lot of modifications. Then Murray comes back and tells Sly and Benley that he feels like he's putting his friends in danger too much and decides to leave the team. So I think that this comic does a pretty good job of being a prequel to this game. While the first comic has little details on what happens to Sly 2, you can just skip that and just play Sly 2 no problem. Here are the events actually lead up to the start of Honor Among Thieves. The writing here is just as good as last time because it has some funny moments, but also has some emotional moments here too, with the part where Murray quits specifically being a highlight. And our style is so much better too because it brings the comic and the animated section in the game so much closer. Even in the games, you reuse a lot of shots from the comics too. I mean, you can call it lazy, but I feel like the artists here are way more confident in their abilities since the first game. Alright, but let's get into the actual story. Sly 3 starts off with personally my favorite intro in the series. It's just Sly in a pretty dark and mysterious atmosphere, spiral jumping, taking out guards one by one, climbing everything, and once Sly comes out of the shadows, he, just, he does his badass dance, and then you see Sly Cooper the Thief. That's how you do an intro. Fucking legendary. Too bad it's not as good in the HD collection, because not only do the black bars in the HD collection don't fill out the entire screen because of its 16.9 aspect ratio, but for some reason this is the only game in the collection where Sly Silhouette West stays the same from the PS2 version. It's like they waited until the third game to finally fix that shit. Also, because the game is in a 16.9 aspect ratio, when Sly comes out of the shadow, the thief part is covered up by his tail, so it just looks like it's saying Sly Cooper the Tiff. So when I first played this game, I had the HD version, so when I was younger, I was just sitting there thinking, what the fuck is a TIFF? Alright, let's get back to the story. So unlike the last two games, Sly 3's prologue actually starts from the last episode, which makes the player wonder what's going on. The Cooper gang's back together? Who are all these random people doing all this stuff? Is this a prequel? Is this game pulling out Metal Gear Solid 3? It can't be because Ben Lee's in a wheelchair because of what happened at the end of Sly 2. And when this all leads up to Sly facing against his new villain who calls himself Dr. Rem, a guy who was in Sly's father's original gang and he grew jealous of him and dedicated the rest of his life to uncovering the secret treasure from the Cooper generations. And when Sly's dad died, he found an opportunity to try and find the Cooper Vault, a vault containing all the stuff that his Cooper bloodline stole over the past generations. And when he's fighting this huge monster and when Sly throws his can at it and the monster swipes it away, the monster grabs Sly and starts to crush him to death, and something about the image of Sly just being crushed by a giant genetic monster while he's struggling to get out just really hit different for me. Like, this shit really got to me when I was younger. I was just sitting there like, wow, Sly might die here. Like, he's facing death itself, and hearing Ben Lee just yelling that he's gonna get Sly out of his grips still gives me chills to this day. Uh, it's weird, Sly is a lot darker than I remember it being. Like, first Ben Lee gets paralyzed at the end of the last game, and then we start off the third game with Sly about to be eaten by a mutated monster. I mean, at this point, I'm surprised that these guys haven't developed PTSD at this point. I mean, I guess Mori has, though. But then we get into the flashback, and I was just thinking, oh my god, are we seriously going through Sly's origin story for the third time? So, Sly 3 is one of those, so you're probably wondering how I got your stories. We recap on the events of the last two games, and we found out that Dr. M has been trying to get into the Cooper Vault for years, and after those years of trying and failing to get in, he built a deadly fortress over it with security cameras all over the place. Sly realizes to get into the fortress that he's going to need a team of thieves to pull off this job. 
and this is where the game really begins. So at this point, we only have Sly and Bentley, so the two track down Murray, who, who quit the team in the second comic because of what happened to Bentley and Sly 2. Sly and Bentley also found out about Don Octavio, who was a former opera singer that got fired because rock music was becoming more popular and wanted to get revenge on everyone who turned him away. They find Murray in Venice, who has undergone a new getup. He's been in the Australian Outback studying the art of dream time, and his teacher, the Guru, sent him here to complete his training. But when Bentley tries to confront Murray about this, he's still skeptical about coming back to the team because of this new path of peace that he's taken up, and he still blames himself for Bentley getting paralyzed, even though Bentley forgives him about that. And Matt Olsen in this scene is just so great. I, I'm sorry, Bentley. I, I tried to save you, but I just wasn't strong enough. Get over it, Murray. I don't blame you, and never have. The only thing I feel bad about is losing my pal. We also found out that Dimitri is in jail because of Carmelita busting him in the first episode of Slide 2, but it makes me wonder how Dimitri is in jail when at the end of Slide 2 he was a dance instructor on the cruise ship. I mean, I guess maybe his employers found out about his shady past and halted him to jail. And, but even then, we busted him in Paris, so what's he doing here in Venice? Anyway, Sly and him make a deal for Sly to make a distraction and for the police force to go after him while Dimitri makes a run for it, resulting in another chase with Carmelita, who for the third time in a row can't aim for shit. Honestly, it's even worse now because when Sly and Murray are just standing there for an entire 10 seconds, Carmelita completely misses all of her shots. Top inspector, my ass. Anyway, we found out Octavia was actually pouring tar into the water streams as a part of his plan for to bring Opera back into the spotlight. After Sly and Bentley ruin his plans to get rock music out of the town, he blows up a building with people in it and kicks Bentley out of his wheelchair and this happens. Murray, I need your help. I've never seen someone move that fast. Octavio's old, but he's still got it. Let's take him together. But, but, I vowed to my guru that I'd renounce all violence and the water is still black. It'll be clear any minute. Trust me. Now, let's take him. You're right to be a scared hippo. Your wheelchair friend should have been so smart. Murray! Help! That does it! I'll floss my teeth with your spine! The Murray returns! The build up to that scene just has so much impact. Anyway, after Murray kicks the shit out of Octavio, he gets arrested and, and actually gets some success being a singer for the prison mates. Murray dons his mask and gloves and joins the team again, but he feels bad about breaking his promise of non-violence from his mentor. So Sly and the rest of the gang go to the Australian Outback to find them, only to find out that there's miners joining into the Outback, meanwhile the group was caught in the middle of all of it. When we finally meet the guru, he actually just speaks gibberish, and for some reason, everyone else around him can understand him. Okay, I can understand how Murray would be able to understand him. He's been with him for the past couple of months, but how can Sly, Bentley, and everyone else just automatically understand what he's saying, no problem? I mean, maybe if Murray just translates what he says to everyone else, I could let that slide, but... I don't know, it just seems kind of stupid. Okay, so when Bentley breaks the guru out, the Mask of Dark Earth is unleashed, and this point in the story gets a lot of flack from the Sly community, and I can understand the criticisms that go against the Mask of Dark Earth, like there not being any backstory to this villain, and, and not having any type of personality. But I kind of like the idea of having a villain that you don't actually fight, but one that is its own entity, and latches themselves onto another person, and have them do their dirty work for them. But I feel like there wasn't a lot of build-up to this mask being this monstrous threat. It's just the mask is bad, you have to stop it before it attaches itself to someone and destroys and shit. I probably feel like Sucker Punch was taking notes from Majora's mask with this mask, but you don't really get the same menacing vibe with a mask of the Dark Earth like with Majora. Anyway, Carmelita arrives and the mask latches onto her face, making her a giantess, which I'm sure will cause any Rule 34 artists to have a nut stain in their boxers. This also makes Sly just sit there and make this face, like, is he okay? I mean, I know it's surprising seeing her like this, but he just sits there and makes that face for an entire 15 seconds. Sly has to climb the Kaiju Carmelita, and it's really worth seeing all this PS2 power giving so much detail to Carmelita here. I, I can see all the stuff on her boot, I can see the detail on her pants, her cleavage, her hips. Look, I'm not judging or anything, but... Is there something you're trying to tell us here, Sucker Bunch? And when Sly unlocks the mask off Carmelita, leaving her unconscious, but of course Sly doesn't want to leave her empty-handed, so he goes through her bag and finds the camera, and he and the gang start taking pictures, so they have something for her to remember them. Anyway, the guru joins and the Cooper gang continues to grow. Bentley then realizes that he needs an RC specialist since his RC skills aren't good enough. So he then goes on some chat logs and finds a girl named Penelope, and when Bentley hits her up on the job, she says that she only works for the best, like her boss, the Black Baron a pilot who's hosting the Ace Flight competition, so Bentley and Murray build their own plane, and Sly steals someone's pilot license, and before they do the job, Penelope sends a picture of what she looks like.
But anyway, once they get there, Sly makes a deal with Dimitri. Dimitri gives Sly and everyone else the flight lineup so they know who to sabotage and Dimitri wants something in return. Mugshot from Sly 1 is also here, but I wonder how he got out of jail in the first place since he was still in jail in the comic. Anyway, they need him out of the way so Benly insults him to make him want to start a street fight with him so he can get set up with Carmelita. I might as well just bring this up now before I forget, but Sly 3 also introduces these new dialogue bosses that have you pick certain sentences to help you progress through the story. But whenever I play this game, I always pick every single sentence or just to see what the characters have to say because honestly, these dialogue boxes lead to some of the funniest moments in the entire game. Look, I got in here through an air vent. We can both use it to escape. I can't fit in no vent. You spy my macho frame. I'm packing too much sexy muscle to fit in vent like you stick dudes. You're a brainless. Seaweed slurping slobber. Ha ha ha! thinks you're a parrot loving, toothless sack of maggots. Oh, really? You're a mumbling, yellow bellied anger head. Ha ha! Cantankerous Tim, it must be you! Forgive this old sea dog and his sunburnt eyes for not recognizing you straight away! Ha you know, I've been thinking about your appearance. Look, if you don't got nothing to say nice, then don't say nothing at all. Get it? What? Ain't got no sassy comments, smart guy? Oh. I get it. You got nothing nice to say, so you're keeping quiet. That's real cute. You really got nothing nice to say? That's cold. I'm not worried about Penelope. A girl tough as that will free herself by tomorrow morning, then come and steal your wallet. Ha! That chickadee will never escape a skull keep. She's locked up in irons, and there she stays until she agrees to love me. Despite all my faults. What was Genghis Khan's favorite meal? The brains of his enemy. Get it? I mean, it's more weird and gross than funny, but I... I mean, you gotta admit, it's pretty weird. Your mother was a broken down tub of junk with more gentleman callers than the operator. And something about the image of Sly wondering if he should threaten Dimitri with violence, threaten to expose him or use a logical army would just never not be funny to me. Anyway, with Monk shot out of the way, that would just leave up to take on the Black Baron, and Sly does it with no problem, but that leads to an altercation with him on his plane. Once Sly defeats the Black Baron, it's revealed that it's actually Penelope in disguise. Penelope kinda looks like an action figure with her Black Baron disguise on. Anyway, Penelope explains that the Black Baron was an alter ego of her that she created because of the age limit that the Dogfighting League has. But after winning the first time, the Black Baron became a huge celebrity and she had to pull on the outfit more and more. But now that he's been defeated, she can finally go on her own path and she joins the team. Now the Cooper Gang needs a demolition expert with skills that are beyond past Bentley's. Bentley suggests that the Panda King from Sly 1 will be a great member. Now this part of the story is a little bit split among the community because it makes people think that why the Panda King out of all people? And I even hear people calling it bad writing, but honestly, I don't get why. It's not like they become friends immediately, it's not like Sly just automatically went, Hey man, you might have killed my dad, but you're my best friend now. They just need to put their differences aside, because they've grown a lot since three years ago. Sly obviously doesn't trust the Panda King, since he's a part of the crew that basically murdered his parents when he was eight years old and did it right in front of him too, but he has to work with them if he wants any chance at getting through the security to get out the Cooper Bowl. Sly pretty much ruined the Panda King's life, and when they find him, He's meditating and just and he's just replaying his memory of, of Sly defeating him over and over again. But Sly told him that it's all not real. But even though he still despises Sly after what happened in the first game, he still needs to put all that patient aside to save his daughter Jane King. It's made pretty clear that they don't like each other, but they don't have a choice other than to work together to reach their goals. What's also pretty cool about this is that one scene, the Panda King is having a conflict with himself, or more like his past self arguing whether he should kill or double cross Sly, or help him and the team out, and this type of character writing is one of the main reasons why people love this series, and if you're asking me, this was a pretty clever way to bring back an old character and then make a new one. But anyway, back to the actual story, Jin King is the Panda King's daughter, and she was captured by Emperor Sal, yeah, and he's a chicken too. He plans on forcing her to marry him, so the Sal and Panda bloodlines will create a new generation of kings. He also revealed that he was the one who convinced the Panda King to take up meditation so he can take him away from her. 
This guy is probably the smartest villain that the team's faced so far, because he actually used the crew's plan of pretending to be Sal's planning committee to his advantage to steal their plan, which no other villain in the series has done up to this point. But I have to ask, did this guy seriously take selfies of himself stealing the plans and also put them in the slideshow somehow? Anyway, the writers really did a great job making this guy a real asshole. I bet you when you're walking into the cell's room and you hear Jin King's crying about how she has no will. No! You can't come out yet, my Blossom! But, please, my father will be so worried. Just let me tell him I'm alright. I beg of you, sir, let me out of this prison. Is this the way you woo your wife? You have shown me nothing but cruelty. I'm so unhappy. <laughs> And especially when he says shit like this. Stop this, Sal. Release Jin King and this fight can end. No! Jin King is mine! Once our bloodlines cross, it shall be glorious! The Panda King in his day was magnificent. With the Tao name, a new generation of kings will be unstoppable. But she doesn't want to marry you. She's a woman. She doesn't know up from down. Did I just hear someone use a microaggression? I'm really tempted to say that this scene would not have slid if this game came out today, but a part of me is kind of surprised at the fact that he got away with saying something that offensive even back in 2005, and in a kid's game too. I mean, maybe this is why Sly 3 got the E10 rating. And it's also really satisfying seeing Carmelita of all people dragging Sexes ass to prison. It's kind of weird how Jack X had a line like this when Samos and Kira were arguing, and both of these came out in 2005, so I feel like there's a bigger picture that I'm not seeing. And there's also a part in this episode where Murray finds a team van that was floating adrift in Sly 2, but it really raises the question on how it got from Canada all the way to China, and where the Panda King reunites with his daughter, and in return, he joins the Cooper Gang. Now we get to episode 5, Dimitri contacts Sly about the favor that he asked for in episode 3, and we find out that his grandfather, Remy Lusto, was a diver for treasure, but all his treasure and gear got stolen by a pirate named Black Spot Pete, and Dimitri wants our help to get them back for an exchange for the Cooper Vault job. Also forgot to bring this up in the last episode, but Penelope starts to catch feelings for Sly after seeing what he can do in the field, Meanwhile, Bentley's getting jealous since he likes her. Oh, so it's gonna be one of those type of relationship stories, isn't it? Anyway, Sly dresses up as Pete's old partner, can't take a risk to him, and after they start insulting each other, they find a treasure map that Pete lost from gambling, and, they, and when they locate the treasure, they get cornered by the real villain of the episode, Lafui, who takes Penelope hostage too. Anyway, after getting their own ship, the gang prepares a lot of assault on Lafui's ship, which involves the Guru somehow taming a giant squid named Crusher. Crusher and the Guru defeat Lafui's men, while Bentley frees Penelope, but Bentley falls out of his wheelchair during the getaway, leaving Penelope to pick up a slack and start fighting Captain Lafui on the mast of his ship and knock him into the harbor. And they just leave him to get eaten by a group of sharks, which is pretty gruesome, but this series has had way darker moments in this, so it doesn't really come as a shock to me. So then Dimitri joins the team as their frogman, and Bentley and Penelope become a couple too. This all leads up to the moment where Sly was in the hands of the mutated monster, and during this time, all Sly is thinking about is how far he and his gang have come since they first met, and how they got this group of thieves on their side only for it all to end like this. And all he can think about now is how he never told Carmelita how he feel, but the more I think about it, how can he? If I try to go up to her, she would have arrested his ass on the spot. And him not being honest with Carmelita doesn't really have to do with the fact of him being a coward. I mean, technically it does, but like, you know what I'm trying to say here. Luckily, Carmelita comes to rescue Sly from the monster's grip, and if you die here, the game over screen is Sly getting eaten. Uh... God damn, this series is so much darker than I remember it being. But if you actually finish that part, the team gets Sly under medical care and tries to get Sly's cane back, but it doesn't seem like anything is working. So when Sly wakes up, he tries to get the cane back himself, leading to him and Dr. Rum battling out on a blimp. And this all leads up to the huge bombshell that Dr. Rum actually used to work for Sly's father in his early years. But because he always felt like he was a sidekick to Sly's father, the team broke up, and now he feels like the same thing is happening with Sly and Bentley. And this is honestly one of the best scenes in the game. My father wouldn't have run with a guy who'd try to steal from the Cooper Vault, let alone attempt to kill his son. Time does strange things to people. Just look at the real leader of your gang, Bentley. Whatever, we're friends, equals. Then why is it called the Cooper Gang, you self-centered egomaniac? That's enough. <laughs> Anyway, Sly and the gang enter the Cooper, but it seems Sly is the only one who can continue from here on out, and Bentley and Murray get rid of the vault while he's gone. Sly goes through the vault by looking at some of the background info from his ancestors and probably the best level in the game. But Dr. Run breaks into the vault, and Sly fights him for a final time with Sly coming out as the winner. Then Carmelita comes into the vault somehow. Okay, how come it took Dr. Run years to even unlock the vault, but she just gets him no problem? I mean, you can make the argument that the vault was already open, but whatever. 
And when Stradurus both fly and knock around, but Dr. Rome shoots a giant energy blast at her, but then Sly jumps in front of it to a protector, and somehow that blast which made him fly all the way to the other side of the vault didn't kill him. But even if survive almost getting crushed to death, and if Bentley can just get crushed by Plopper's beak and just leave with a broken spine, then I guess in the context of this universe, it would make sense for him to survive that. Carmelia finishes up Sly's fight and goes up to check on him. He appears to have amnesia, and she uses that as an opportunity to, to have Sly thinking that she's her partner. They escape while Dr. M lets the ball collapse upon himself because he didn't want to give up the Cooper fortune. The guy starts looking for Sly, but he leaves a calling card next to him opening a treasure. Sly never came back, so the team split up for a final time. Well, at least, in the, at least for this game, it was the, the final time. Murray continues with his training with the Guru and then later becomes a professional race car driver. The Guru takes on new students who are rock stars and causes unwanted media attention, so he moves to New York since he thought no one would find him that Wait, 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 wait. He went to New York to avoid getting media attention. Why? That's like the that's the last place you want to go if you're trying to avoid attention. That's like that's like saying, oh, I don't want to go to a cold place and then buying plane tickets for Antarctica. Anyway, Dimitri became a professional scuba diver and got tons of money and bitches too. The Panda King goes back to China, living two doors down from his daughter, while he screens all of her future husbands. So far, she's still unmarried. Finally, Bentley and Penelope build a new Cooper Vault and guard it with lasers, and also hints that he's gonna build a time machine to see if he and the rest of the guys are gonna have more adventures together. And in after credits, Bentley sees Sly and Carmelita on a balcony, and Sly winks at him, implying that he faked his amnesia, ending Sly 3. So again, Sly Rebunch doesn't really disappoint with the story here, and in my opinion, it's the best in the series. Like, I feel like it has the, like, the best character interactions, the best writing, the best dialogue, I, the best, like, I, I, just feel like, I just really like the story here. Well, if Sly 3 does different with his story, besides not having Murray in the beginning and starting at the end, this game's episodes are a little more episodic than the last two games, because events from one episode don't carry over to the next. But I feel like since the episodes and events don't care from one another, it kind of makes hyping up the suspense for a villain hard to do in one episode alone. But at the same time, no villain here overtakes or welcome like Rajon did in the last game. But this also makes the character interaction shine too. Between the three games, Sly 3 is definitely the one that had me cracking up the most because I feel like by the third game, the writers knew these characters as much as the characters themselves knew each other, so they knew what Sly, Murray, and Bentley would say in certain situations, and already knew how their team dynamic works. I hope you realize that by saving Carmelita, we're only making our operation here more difficult. Maybe so, but what's the fun in stealing if there's nobody trying to catch you? Besides, she's helped us out in the past. That, and you've got a thing for her. And I've got a thing for her. And, and it's also leads to them actually talking to each other like they're actual friends, and I know I said the same thing about Sly 2, but the writing here is really hilarious, and they tease each other a lot too, but it feels more playful here, like how Vanley talks about how bad Sly's Italian accent is. I can't believe that worked! You've got the worst Italian accent I've ever heard! No offense. Actually, the joke about Sly's Italian accent is actually Kevin Miller's Sly's voice actors. Best time about an Italian accent, and developers just decided to joke about it in the context of the game. I mean, it is pretty terrible for being honest. But yeah, I think the writing and dialogue is at their best in this game because of how much it just has me laughing. Like seriously, ask any Sly fan what their favorite moment is from this game, and I, and I guarantee goddamn tea that they'll either say the guard who wants to be buried in his mom's pasta sauce. Ah, oh, am I glad you're here. Mama's making spaghetti tonight and I'm starving. I'm gonna eat like three, no four plates full. I guess that you really like a cooking. Mamma mia, I want to be buried in her sauce. It's a heaven. Any problems with that guy? Said he wanted to be buried in his mom's pasta sauce. Yeah, that's uh, that's strange. You know, I just can't get it out of my head. Have you ever had pasta sauce that tasty? I don't want to distract you or anything, but I just don't think I've ever had cooking that good. Are we like missing out on a whole universe of flavors here? You know, maybe there's a good Italian restaurant around here. Enough with the sauce! Keep your focus, we're on a job here! Thugs everywhere, death around every corner! You're right, we got one more coffee house to hit, then we're done. Yes, now you're talking sense! And then, we eat. Bentley's opera duo with Octavio. La 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 la! La 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 la
Mission episode two. Listen up, dirtbags. Time to clear out. From now on, this bar is Cooper Gang turf. Tough took waga. But you ain't got no respect with us. We here are known around these parts for our drinking skills. And this just happens to be a lemonade bar. Merch trying to make the Belgian flyer laugh. Ever see someone put their fist down their throat? ta -da! Hey, fish! Stuck! I need help! Hey! <laughs> Bentley's trying to insult Mugshot. My head is spitting from your breath! What, do you gargle with raw sewage every night before bed? Yeah, you're half right. I find a nice tang to my breath helps maintain my... Poisonal space. And well, and when Bentley first sees Penelope's picture, like there's so many to choose from. I, I want to say it's like Ratchet and Clank levels of funny. Miss Gears may be in league with Doctor Nefarious. Yeah, who knew? She always seems so sweet and innocent in her videos. Well, except for that one with the, you know. The... Him. <clears throat> what the fuck? No. But the humor is definitely at its best with this game. But it doesn't mean it's not harmful moments too, because this game has a lot of funny moments, but also no one to take things seriously. I feel like since Bentley's accident in the last game, the game got a lot closer to each other, and it made sure that one another is okay because that's what friends do, and this also goes along with each character's development. Let's start with Bentley. So at this point, Bentley's arc of coming out of his shell, no pun intended, comes full circle. Even though he's set back after what happened in Slide 2, but because of that, Bentley programmed his wheelchair to do all the shit that Daddy did when his legs worked. He's also a lot more malicious and underhanded in his plans than he was before. Not so much from being a straight up super villain, but you know, stuff like just sitting there and watching that while Octavio's goons fight an interval fight each other, or just overloading the circuitry on a Ferris wheel. But when Penelope gets involved in the picture, this is where things start to get a little bit muddled. Not in terms of like storytelling, but there's just this one scene that really bothered me. In episode 5, Bentley starts getting jealous that Penelope's giving more attention to Sly than to him, and when they have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, Bentley just outright says that he wishes that he can do all the things that Sly does, but he can't because he's in a wheelchair, and whenever I see this cutscene, I just think, really man, are you seriously mad about the fact that you're not as athletic as Sly, and that, and that you're in a wheelchair even though you're just as, a, maybe even more capable in the wheelchair than you are on your legs? I mean, I know it's there for character development, but come on, you program rocket boots on your wheels, you can hover for a couple of seconds, you can pickpocket guards. Honestly, Bentley getting paralyzed is the best thing that's ever happened to him. What? But I feel like the way that Bentley and Penelope's relationship develops is actually really good. I know it looked like I didn't really like it at first, but honestly, it's pretty crucial to his arc because at first, Penelope took a liking to Slice since he was the hero and it made Bentley feel inadequate compared to him. But when he and Penelope have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and when he guides Penelope when she's blinded, he earns Penelope's respect and the two of them become a couple at the end of episode 5. I mean, they catfish each other to even get to that point, but I guess love conquers all. And yeah, I might not like the scene where Bentley was doubting himself about his abilities, but it does lead up to this scene right here, where some people would say that it comes out of nowhere, but I really like this scene though. Do you ever feel like you're playing second fiddle to Sly? Like he treats us as sidekicks? No way! Sly's cool! We're all in this together! Sure, we're all here, but are we equal? Who went into the vault? Sly. By himself. Think of it this way, Bentley. If it were you in that vault and Sly and I were out here, what would he do? 
stop these thugs, and protect his friend. Right, and that's what I'm gonna do! Since Bellu was already feeling secondary to Sly in the last episode, because the Penelope was getting pretty close to Sly, anyway, it also thought that in the same episode, Dr. M was trying to say that Sly was making the team about himself and making the others just sidekicks like his father did. Sly's character arc, in my opinion, doesn't really go through as much as in Thieves Raccoon is, but I feel like it's more fleshed out here than it was in 2. I feel like Sly's arc in this game could be summed up as Sly watching everyone else grow and become new people, and then eventually growing and moving on himself. That's kind of the main theme of this game, moving on and learning to work with the changes, but I'll get to that later. I feel like his development doesn't really play into effect until the last episode, but there's little bits and pieces of this because when Sly fights General Sal, he thinks that Sly would be a great opponent because of his Cooper family bloodline, but then Sly tells him this. The Sal line is master in this place! Hear me, Sly Cooper! My lineage surpasses yours in every way! It's not about the family name, pal. It's what you do with it. And this also leads to one of the last scenes of the game where Sly tells Dr. Rum that he's, that he's his own person, and what happened with his dad and Dr. Rum isn't anything like him and Bentley. The current Cooper gang is gonna be like the last one. This one treats each other like equals, and there's a mutual respect between each other. Murray's development isn't as deep here as it was in Sly 2, but it's still a pretty good arc about how he feels bad that he couldn't save Bentley in time, so he goes on to a journey to find himself. And he doesn't feel right about joining the Cooper gang again because he can't handle seeing Bentley in a wheelchair, even though Bentley made it perfectly clear that, that he's over it. But after Donna Table kissed Bentley out of his wheelchair and recreates the moment why Bentley doesn't want to rejoin the Cooper gang, Murray breaks the train and decides to forget about what happened to Sly 2, and that's pretty much all there is to his arc in this game. And there's also the scene where Murray tries to risk his life to get this team van to safety, and I didn't really think much about this scene, but now that I'm writing this video, this scene also shows how far Murray's come from the first game, from trying to do all the stuff that Sly does, but being too scared to get out of the field. He definitely started to break out of it in Sly 2, but I really think that this scene right here really shows that that old Murray is gone. You know, for a character who can just be summed up as someone who just wants to wreck shit, he goes through the most development in the series. But the other characters that the Cooper gang recruit are pretty cool too. I already went into the Panda King, but Dimitri's interactions with the rest of the gang are as just as hilarious as they were in Sly 2 because his massive ego really helped out solve with how humble everyone else. We, oui. the turtle dude makes sounds for a scuba. There you go, baby. Dimitri are natural. Woo! Your plan is to work to perfection. My plan to get you alone in a swimsuit? Come clean, my lovely, and play your cards straight. These are dangerous waters, and I'm a big, strong, macho, macho man. Okay, first, get over yourself. Second, I mean it, get over yourself. Totally language from such sweet lips. I die, baby. I die for the love. You were magnificent. Alone against a creature trapped in an undersea cave. How about a kiss from a show magnificento? My lips are warm like bread from the oven. Slow down. Remember rules one and two, both of which told you to get over yourself. Book before my magnificence! Yum, yum! Give me some! I'm gonna check on Bentley. You have fun being you. I might do the jack to the Ibison, baby! Penelope was always my favorite character in this game, but honestly, thinking about it now, She's not my favorite, but she's a really great character. Yeah, you know, she and Bentley really balance off each other really well, and the loyalty to her boss really shines through when she starts working with the Cooper gang, and then she starts showing loyalty to them too. Plus, she almost looks like Coco Bandicoot to me. I don't know, I guess it's probably the overalls or the little strand of hair that goes down her face. The Guru is the only character I could have done without, but he does have a couple of funny moments, so I don't really think him being here is pointless, and he is the reason why Murray goes through the development that he goes through, so he's cool with me. Also really helps on the voice acting in this game as that is best here. Kevin Miller and Matt Olsen are amazing in their funny moments, but also have their more emotional moments because they really know how to make the tone of their voices match and at least have some pretty great moments too. But I don't really know about the direction that Chris Murphy takes with Murray's voice in this game. I might be big and not as smart as the other guys, but one thing I'm not is weak. Look, I want to help you. You're like my second best friend. It's just that I promised I'd stay here and peacefully meditate till the black water ran pure. I don't know, it just sounds kind of raspy. His voice in this game isn't terrible, like, I mean, he's still written like Murray, but I just got so used to his voice in the last game. I also feel like some of the more heavier scenes that can fall flat on his face because of his delivery sometimes. I hear some people like it more, and if you do, then, hey, more power to you then. But I don't know what the fuck happened to Carl Lita's voice in this game. That's right! Hide in the sewers like the rat you are! This time we have Ruth Livier and... 
I'm just gonna be upfront with this, I don't like her Carmelita. I must have something clogging my ears back then because I don't I don't remember her voice sounding this bad. What was on Alicia Glidewall in the last game? She brightly brought the character of the life in Slide 2, and I might have criticized Carmelita as a voice actor in the first game for sounding emotionless, but she's miles better than her voice here. She just sounds so nasally and whiny too. And, and it causes her lines to not be as impactful as they should be, and honestly, it just clashes with Sly's great voice acting. But maybe I'm being too hard, she only voices her in this game. But the voice actors for their villains are doing their best at least. And I should probably talk about the villains now, and I honestly think that the villains in this game are some of the best in the series. I already talked about General Cell and how underwhelming the Mask of Dark Earth was, but characters like Don Octavio and the Black Bear are really well written. Doctor is especially one of the best villains in the series too. There's a menacing vibe to him that I haven't felt since Clockwork in the first game, and he's definitely more of a fleshed out villain than Nilo was. I mean, the opening cutscene of this game, he just straight up murders a guy while he was talking to him about his wife and kids, so you can already tell that this guy's been fucking around. And he's the only villain in the series that who actually had Sly on the brink of death, and because of his backstory, you don't you don't sympathize with the guy, but you can understand where he's coming from. But this is where the game's overall themes come in. I said these games have a lot of overlapping themes in their plots. With Sly 1, you can sum it up as being a revenge story, with Sly 1 to get back to, at the people who murdered his family, and basically stole his birthright, and clockwork hating the Cooper clan for whatever reason. Personally, I always felt like it had more to do with reputation, since Sly said this in the opening cutscene. I knew I was about to face the toughest test of my life. On this mission, I would either become a master thief like my ancestors before me, or fail and allow my family name to bite the dust. Yeah, this plot was about Sly avenging his parents, but also felt more personal than an avenging his plans and felt more like upholding his family name. And when he finally gets all the page of the Devious Raccoonus back, he starts bragging about how he earned his birthright. And it was also Clockwork wanted to bring down the Cooper clan and proving that the Devious Raccoonus, the bloodlines mean nothing. With Sly 2, the themes aren't as clear as they are in Sly 1, but I think we'll go with abusing position of power since the Contessa used her role as the chief of Interpol to brainwash criminals into telling people where they, where they keep their treasures, and Nilo used her position to start a full-out war on the Contessa. In this game, Sly 3 always had things about letting things go, learning to forgive one another, and going with changes. I don't want to go too much into details because I'm pretty sure Jay's reviews already did that way better than I ever could, so... I'll try to keep this as brief as I can. Now this theme is in every episode of the game, and shows a massive contrast between the heroes and the villains, since the heroes tend to move on and learn and learn and grow from the changes, while the villains rather hold on to the past and not move on, or in Dr. M's case, not forgiving Sly's father and instead holding on to that resentment for the rest of his life. Dr. M is the best example of this, but we can also look at Octavian as an example of this because, instead of moving on and accepting the fact that opera music isn't popular anymore, he decides to use the new power as a mob boss to make people listen to his music whether they like it or not. He's the villain because he refused to go with the changes of time and wants to get revenge on the masses that basically ruined him. Ironically, when he gets held off to jail, he gets a huge fan base when he starts singing opera songs there. I didn't really think people in prison would be opera fans, but... Okay, good good for him, I guess. Meanwhile, Murray isn't doing himself any favors holding on to the past, but after confronting Osavio, Murray gets the wake-up call that he needs to let go of his past and do his best now, which lets him rejoin the team again. So I have to let go of the past so he and the Panda game can work together. The Panda can realize how much damage he and his partners have done to Sly's life, and if he can push all that aside to reach his goals, why shouldn't he? Then we get to the final confrontation with Sly and Dr. Rum, who are basically the two represent the two sides of change and growth, and at the end, Sly uses the chance to fake amnesia to start over with Carmelita, and Dr. Rum refuses to leave the Cooper while dying in the process. You know, the more I make these videos, I, the more I realize that storytelling is something that I'm really interested in because I really love analyzing the deeper meaning and hidden messages in the games that I like playing when I was younger. So, so uh, yeah, that took about from this Sly 2 story summary, so, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think I should just go into the gameplay now since I feel like that's easier to, like, dive into the story here. Do you guys actually, like, watch the entire story summary even when they take up, like, two-thirds of the entire video? Alright, I'll try to keep this short. The gameplay structure is mostly the same from Sly 2. You have hub world, it's Jowsprout everywhere, and you have to save health to switch characters, or getting upgrades for characters on Thiefnet. But there's also a couple of tweaks with the structure of the games, so let's start with what's different. First, when switching characters, there's not an icon on top of the character's head, so you know which character to switch for a mission to pull, and it makes it a little bit more streamlined, so now you don't have to go out of the safe house with Bentley and then go like, oh shit, I have to play this mission as Murray. To be fair, it doesn't really take that much to pick one character and then go back and switch to another character, but I appreciate the attempt to show the player what order to do things in. Whenever you're stuck and you don't know where to go for a mission, you can just press the R3 button and you have this reticle to direct you on where you need to go, so if you only have Rory or Bentley, you don't have to worry about getting lost anymore. Hub worlds have been toned out in Slide since Slide 2, and some people might see that as a downgrade, but to me, this is a good compromise because the hubs in this game are big enough to explore, but at the same time, they don't feel too spacious like some of the hubs in Slide 2. 
There's not opening cutscenes for every single level in this game. Light 2 did that with this first level, but now it's at the start of every level, and it really shows off how great this game looks too. There's also these buttons spread out around the area that drop objects on the guards, which does sound cool, but it's probably better to just take them out normally because they're very situational. There's also not any more missions where you take pictures of the of an objective for a plan. It only happens once in the first episode where you have to take pictures of Don Octavio poisoning the fish tanks in Venice. There's also less episodes in this game than there were in the last game. Sly 3 only has 6 episodes instead of having 8 episodes, and while having less content than the last game might sound like a flaw for some people, to me, it's something that the game has going for it because no episode felt like it was dragging on longer than it needed to where in Sly 2, episodes just felt like they were going on forever and I, and I was just waiting for them to end. All the episodes flowed very smoothly for me, I didn't get frustrated, I didn't get bored, sometimes I would just get surprised at how long I was recording footage because it honestly didn't feel like I was recording longer than it actually was. There's also no more clue balls in each level, but if you're asking me, that's honestly an improvement. And in this place, there's the option to replay jobs and missions for extra content, but I'll get to that later. The last change in terms of the hub world is that there's no longer any items in the overall where you can sell on Thiefnet, and I hear some people not liking it, but I'm a little bit mixed on that because I actually don't mind not having those in the hub world because like I said in the last video, my playstyle on slide 2 would always have me pickpocket every garden around the area for coins, or for pocket items I can sell on Thiefnet, or just smashing everything in sight. In this game, all the coins that the items that amount for are already counted to your coins total, and that makes things a little bit more streamlined, but if you want to get power-ups for the characters, you're gonna need to grind coins by pickpocketing or smashing shit, which again, I didn't really mind until I got to the story-related items, like Bentley's grappling can in episode 4. While I was too busy buying other power-ups, I forgot you need the grappling hook to progress through episode 4, so I had to start combing the area for coins, but to be fair, this only happened to me once in my entire 12 hours of gameplay, so, so this doesn't really bother me personally, but I can see why it would bother other people. So now that's all out of the way, let's talk about the main trio. So if you play Slide 2, then you should have no problem getting into the Slide 3 because Slide control is almost identically in this game. The only difference is that Slide's uppercut is only relegated to stealth sections, so if you try to press the triangle button while they're not behind the guard, Slide will just charge his cane for a more powerful swing. That, and whenever Slide swings his cane in midair, for some reason he just stops dead in his tracks. Like, it never really caused me to die, but I never really hear anyone else bring this up because it's just really awkward. Sly could also switch into costumes in episodes 1, 4, and 5 to trick guards into letting you in their hideout, take pictures of just straight up soul people. These are fine, but every time the guard sees you, you have to enter his password, which doesn't really bother me personally because it leads to some pretty funny dialogue, but I can see why people would see this as a pace break though. Sly can also open up safe, but it isn't really used that much after the second level, so it's not really fleshed out as much. Sly also has some combat upgrades. He can charge his cane three times to push guards, do a powerful swing, and do this uppercut move. The more you power it up, the more powerful your attacks become. And I'm glad that I spent the coins to get these because because some of these guys have gotten buffed in strength since Sly 2. Some of these guys hit like sports cars going 500 miles per hour. A hit from the big guys can take a quarter to a third of your health. Even Mario can't take out guards in two hits anymore. But I kinda like this since it adds a little bit more depth to the combat since Mario was already the powerhouse character and now Sly can charge his cane swings. It probably wouldn't be fair to have the guards take be go down in one hit. Or well, if you like how Sly controlled in Band of Thieves, then you should love how he controls in this game. The movement is tight and precise, he's just as agile as he was before, and, and traveling through the worlds of them was always pretty fun. Mario's also the same from the last game, he's still the character that you want to go for when you want to deal with the combat scenarios, but since the guards have beefed up in this game, it would take at least 5-6 to six hits before they finally go down. Anyway, now that Murray's a student of the Dreamtime, he now has his ball form, which lets him roll on the ground like a bowling ball or bounce high in the sky. You use it throughout the missions, but it's really helpful for when traveling throughout the hub world. I mentioned in the last video that traveling through the hub worlds in 2 or two was really tedious as Bentley and Murray since they don't have the agility that Sly does. Murray was probably the worst out of the two because Bentley might be weaker, but he has his little hover pack that can let him reach higher places. Murray has a shorter jump and when traveling to a mission marker as him, you have to go the long way around. Here, Murray can just bounce his way up to anywhere he wants. I didn't use this move that much on my first playthrough, but on my second playthrough, using this was just so much fun getting from place to place, and it's also really nice looking at some of the levels from this point of view. It's also just quicker bouncing from the safe house to the mission marker. Overall, Murray was better here than he was in the last game, and I already thought that he was pretty fun to play as in Band of Thieves. Even though Bentley's in a wheelchair this time around, he still plays pretty similar to how he did last time. Ironically, he's more physically capable in his wheelchair than he was when his legs did work. He can use his wheelchair as a means of attacking, he can quadruple jump with his wheelchair modifications, he can still dark guards and bomb them, and he can also craft the coast of certain safe with art decryption locks by thoroughly examining the art. I said that Bentley was my favorite character to play as in the last game because, because he felt like the character to choose when you really want to feel sneaky because of his small height and because of the fact that he's weaker than Sly and Murray and he has to rely on his machines to get around. Now that he has a wheelchair that can do twice the stuff that he can do on his foot, this just makes it even more fun for me. 
The only downside about Medley being in a wheelchair now is that he can't really do that goofy little run cycle anymore, but what made me feel better is that Bentley has an upgrade where he can just start boosting all over the place like he just needed 10 lines of Kalami and Cocaine. Just look at him go. And probably the best part of it all, both Bentley and Murray can pickpocket now and in their own unique ways too. Okay, Bentley picks pockets with his bag and meanwhile, Murray's straight up mugs these guys. Sly pretty much pickpockets the same way he did in the last game, but now, this probably might have been a detail in Sly that I never noticed until now, but whenever a guard has an item in their pocket, they start glowing so you know they have to have more than pocket change in there, but for some reason, when you pick out all the stuff in the guard's pocket, Sly is still in his pickpocketing position, and he doesn't go back to a sneaky position, so you know that there's no more stuff in their pocket. I mean, that's kind of weird, I thought that was a pretty cool detail in the last game. But what made me feel better about this though, that is doing this in the menu screen. You can still buy upgrades in this game by ThiefNet, and they're about as useful as they were in the last game. I've already talked about the cane powers that Sly gets, but Bentley's grapple cane missions are pretty fun, and you can call out the guards to make them come to a specific location or distract them. You're a bad person! I need it! Plus you get to hear Bentley insult them, and that's always funny. Yo mama! Bentley also has the insanity strike that Sly had in the last game so he can drop bombs and make guards attack each other. But Bentley also has an upgrade for him to just throw bombs from a distance so he can scare the shit out of other guards for wondering what happened to their best friend. Murray has the Flame of Fist from the last game, and he has a new move called the Berserker Charge, which was lets Murray ram into people like he's a freight train. Then there's Raging Inferno Flop, which isn't the same as the regular Body Slam attack, but the Blast Radius is larger. Okay, but I think that covers the main trio. They all control mostly the same way they did before, but now that the Cooper Gang has four new members, we, all, we now have seven playable characters, the Guru, Penelope, the Panda King, and Dimitri. The characters aren't actually playable like the main trio, they're more like extensions to the missions, and anyway, let's start with the Guru. The Guru uses his Dreamtime abilities to complete missions, and because of his path of non-violence, he can't attack any guards, so he mostly possesses enemies to travel around the area at fast speeds, which also allows him to break structures by ramming the possessed guards into them. Oh, okay, fighting is too much violence, but ramming guards' heads into solo objects is just fine. He could also use his staff to blend in with his surroundings, preventing enemies from spotting him, and tricking enemies that already have spotted him. I hear people saying that playing as the Guru was terrible, but I honestly don't get why, because I thought that his sections were, were actually designed pretty well. I like the last missions because they feel pretty good beating them, and whenever you get caught, you can just transform it into an inanimate object, and the guard would just act like they didn't see you to begin with. Overall, the Guru is decent fun. Now we have Penelope, but you never actually play as her directly. As so you play as her RC vehicles. It's pretty much a replacement for Bentley's RC section in Slide 2. Her RC chopper has a grappling hook that latches onto enemies, obstacles, and other objects. The chopper's thrusters are used to pull anything the hook latches onto, but I swear this thing almost never clings onto the thing that, that it's under. But at least there's only two missions when you're doing that. Her RC core is good for ground speed, it's very quick too. It also has a turn that can shoot away any obstacle that gets in its way, and in episode 5, there's these ramps that it can jump over, and, it, and that's always fun. At least whenever I don't overshoot or undershoot a jump, it, like, like, it's the worst when I miss a jump, because after that it's just like, uh, 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 I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go, go all the way away and, and, and drive, drive from some ramp again. again. I also really like the mission where you have to avoid all those security lasers, and it's a pretty tricky one too. It took me like 15 minutes before finally finishing it, but it's kind of annoying how when you beat that mission, the next mission after that is to destroy all the lasers that you were trying to avoid before. So then what the fuck was the point of the last mission where we had to avoid getting caught by the security lasers? Then there's the last mission where we have to race all the security drones and then pick up their energy to get to the radar tower, and I had fun with that mission, except when I just trip over absolutely nothing. Like seriously, what flipping you over there, oxygen? I, I don't get what happened, did you guys catch it? And anyway, most of all these missions are pretty fun, and her RC vehicle sections are way better than Bentley's in the last game. Next we have the Panda King, another character people don't seem to like that much, and I don't really get why. He's basically like Murray if Murray relied on fireworks as a means of attack. He can target multiple enemies while loading his fireworks when the player moves the camera in their direction, but if you overload the fireworks, they can explode on you. His only melee attack is a Flame Fuwa style of Karate Chop, which is which instantly sets weaker enemies on fire, but it's not as useful as the fireworks, which confuses the fuck out of me, because you would think that a character whose main trait is that he knows a lot of Flame Fu moves that what he used to fight Sly in the first game, but all we get here is just his fireball, but I'm not too butthurt by that, because I'm already fine with the style that we ended up here. That just leaves Dimitri, the scuba diver of the team, and honestly, he's my least favorite character to play as in this game. And even then, his gameplay style is subpar at worst. It's all in the first person view, but the controls are really hard for me to get used to. You have to use the face buttons to move up and down and left and right, and you use the L stick to aim. It's pretty awkward for me. Dimitri has a spear gun, but every time you fire a shot, there's a cooldown period, so you can't use it multiple times at once. But I felt like the shots almost never connect with this thing, and even if they did, the sharks would just shrug it off like someone just threw a pebble at them. 
Dimitri can also shift left and right really quickly if you hold the L1 button, but it costs you your stamina, and you're gonna need to do that if you want to get through the second mission where you have to get Slive Kane back, because this mission really tests your reflex and leaves no room for error. It's honestly kind of rewarding getting through that, but my hands get so sweaty after replaying it so many times. After I die a couple of times, like, I get flustered and then I fuck out close to the beginning. Dimitri is definitely the worst of the playable characters, his gameplay isn't even that bad, but at least he only gets two missions in the game, so, so he doesn't really overstay his welcome. Now we have the last character, and while she's not a part of the Cooper gang, we still get to play as Cormelia in a couple of missions, and she plays like a first person shooter. She strays by default, but you can turn it off if you want to. I don't know why you want to do that in the first place, but you can do that. And I really gotta say, it's funny to me how Cormelia's aim was so goddamn bad in the older games, including this one, but yet when you're playing as her, aiming is so easy. Like, it's really hard to miss your targets with Carmelita. I mean, look at this. Halfway through the game, there's a mission where Carmelita has to chase down Sly and knock him out with a shock pistol. And look how easily I'm just shooting him over and over again. If Carmelita got her own spin-off game where it played like this, she would've hauled Sly off to jail a long time ago. She also has this roundhouse kick move, but it's so short range that I barely even use it. I actually forgot about it until I was writing this video. She also has this high jump where she just launches into the air like she's Spider-Man, and I can never get tired of using it. Like, it's just so much fun to do. The only problem I have with it is the fact that to perform it, Carmelita has to be at a standstill, so... Yeah, that kinda sucks, but it's still a fun move nonetheless. So count all new members of the Cooper Gang and Carmelita, that brings us to the total of 8 playable characters, which is pretty crazy, but we're not done just yet, because just like the last two games, let's talk about the different mission types, and if you've seen the last two videos, you already know that I hated most of these different mission types because in one, they were just not that fun and didn't really have any business being in the game because they don't because they don't really contribute to the whole theme of stealth, and in two, they just fucking blow. But in this game, this might be the controversial opinion, but I actually think that the different mission types are actually kind of fun in this game. Let's just get the ones that I don't like out of the way. First we have the Five Nights at Freddy's mission in episode 3, which just has you press the face buttons over and over again. But then at the end, there's multiple guards coming through both cameras, and you need catalyte reflex to try to switch from one to the other so quickly. But really, when I did this mission for 100% completion, I finished it on my first try, when on my first and second playthrough, I was getting folded so many times, so I don't know what's going on here. I, I, mean, I guess maybe after just failing so many times, I just got better at it. I don't know. And then there's this mission where I have to protect Murray while he's trying to get the team van back on the solid ground. And you have to shoot multiple guards while they're ganging up on him. And for some reason, these guards don't go down in one hit, even after getting shot by a fucking turret. But you also have to be careful because you can shoot Murray by accident too. And you guys don't know how much I hated that shit in the first game, it's not any better here. At least Murray actually has a reason why he can't fight back in this situation. He's not just hiding in fear, hoping that the guards go away. Bentley hacking comes back here too, but there's not as many here as it was in Sly 2, so they're fine by me. Then we have the Scorpion Challenge in Episode 2, and it's not really terrible, but after the second half, it's just pretty boring. And it's a real pain in the ass trying to trap the Scorpions, and if you miss, it takes like an eternity trying to get back up, and then controls in this truck are awkward as fuck too. And, like, backing up and turning feels so goddamn stiff. But honestly, those are the only missions in this game that I thought were genuinely bad. The biplane missions are pretty cool. Shooting down the enemy planes feel pretty satisfying, and the planes really feel smooth to control too. I just wish that there were more checkpoints around here and there were more health pickups for whenever you're running whole on health, but it's still a pretty good minigame. The boat chase sections in episode 1 gave me a lot of shit on my first playthrough, but on my second playthrough when I wasn't recording, I beat both the first chase and the second one we were chasing Donald Octavia on my first attempt, when I just told myself, alright, just stop jumping every time they jump, and you should be good. I guess not having my Elgato recording probably helped with that too, because the missions that were giving me a lot of trouble on my, on my playthrough when I was recording were a complete breeze on the, on the playthrough that I wasn't recording. And there were the sewer missions where you have to use this raft arm tube app, and, and it definitely starts to pick up in the latter half of the game where you're taking out the support beams for the windmill and taking out power ships. I even like the Prey mini game. there's just something really fun about just launching guards into an electric fence to me. The Lemonade Bard is honestly the, one of the best missions in the entire series, and I think this is the first time I ever played a mission in the game where we have to start a bar fight, and this was before I played Uncharted 3 too. You throw people into a fire pit, electric fences, and on top of it all off, you get to fight this mini boss where at the end of it all, we have to lure it into these traps that Bentley and Murray set off, so Sly can start beating on him. I love this mission, and it's one of the highlights of the entire trilogy in my opinion. And then we have the power ship, which is also my favorite gameplay style in the entire game, and this is another style that everybody hates too, and I don't get why. I mean, I could have done without all this wide empty space, I mean, oh goddamn, this is all just as bad as one with your C, and I kind of wish they didn't map the controls to the L and R triggers, but the rest of it's pretty fun to me. All my here is pretty cool too, because this is where you get to grind for coins by destroying other ships, and raiding other pirate ships for treasures, and other stuff. If you want to get fights done over, just shoot the mass of the ship, it's a guaranteed kill if you do that. I should probably bring this up now because I'll probably forget about it later. So remember how some copies of Slide 2 came with a USB headset to call out the guards? Well, Slide 3 kind of has the same thing. When Slide 3 was coming out, 3D glasses were pretty popular on 2005, so they decided to add that into the game with some of these missions. I did it for one mission just to see how it would look without the glasses, and for some reason, it's not in black and white, frame rate is cut in half, and on my console specifically, it messed up with the game's aspect ratio, and so now it just looks weird. 
There's an option to play the whole game with this filter on, but, but unless you have the 3D glasses that came with the game, why would you want to do that? All three games in the HD collection have this feature, which sounds pretty cool, but who cared about 3D in 2010? Anyway, I feel like Slide 3's extra content is something that the game has going for it. My biggest problem with Slide 2 was the game's pacing, and the fact that the game never really switches up its gameplay. I can only get a lot of fun out of Spyro Jumping with Sly and Body Sam with Murray for so long. While that's mostly the same with Slide 3, all the different styles for me keeps the main gameplay from getting repetitive. The only reason why I'm going to so much depth about the different content in this game is because I hear people saying that Slide 3's multiple gameplay style is the main reason why it's not as good as Slide 2, and I just don't want to say this right now. I never really understood the argument that Slide 3 has too many different gameplay styles when you can make the same argument with Slide 1 and Slide 2. Hell, I always hated the extra shit in Slide 1, and I was just waiting until I can get back to the main platforming. Many games have been with the series since the beginning, so I don't know why it's suddenly now a problem. It, is, it seriously took you guys three games to realize that this franchise has mini games. Overall, I feel like Honor Among Thieves is the only game in the series that actually has a mini game that I don't feel shoehorn in, just had them actually be fun and not just frustrating. And also because they have a, more of a reason to be here and not just be the variety for the sake of variety, that much this game does better than Jack 3. Slide 3 also has a multiplayer mode because, I don't know, Ratchet Clank did a year before, so why not Sly? There's four different modes, Cops and Robbers with one player as Carmelita and the other one as Sly. Hackathon, which is basically just the hacking minigames, but, with, but two people play as Penelope and Bentley, and work together to get through all the hacking levels with a shared set of lives. Biplane Duel is pretty much like the main game's dogfighting, but just like in Cops and Robbers, player 1 is Sly and player 2 is Carmelita. The first one gets 10 kills wins. And finally, there's Galleon Duel, and it's exactly like the main game. Player 1 is Sly with Murray piloting the ship, and player 2 is Bentley with Penelope piloting his ship. The first player to defeat the other player 3 times wins. I was actually kind of excited to play these co-op games for the first time, and now that I finally got to play them, I think me and my friend Josh can agree that they're nothing really special. Cops and Rubber is probably the best one since it's the only one that uses the core mechanics. When you run around Venice, I fly collecting loot in certain locations, and meanwhile Carmelita is chasing down Sly and shooting them down. You can use power to get ahead of the other player. It's all good fun if you're playing as Sly, and unfortunately for Josh, I was the Sly and he was stuck playing as Carmelita, so he kept on losing. That's really the only real bad part about this. That and the fact that the split screen kind of strains my eyes too. The background images make the screen too small for me to see. We also somehow glitched out the game to have the match still going even when I finished it, and even when Josh killed me, I still won. The frame roll also tanks whenever Carmelita shoots stuff. And then there's Hackathon, which I guess is alright, but... <laughs> it's just that... It takes for fucking ever. This mode goes on for way too long. I got so bored that I just sat in the corner and did nothing for the rest of the match and just had Josh do everything while I just started writing notes for this video. But I do like the attention to detail how if we don't recruit Penelope in the main campaign, then the second player is Sly. That was pretty cool. Then we have Biplane Duel, which is pretty cool, but since it's hard to see the other players, it can drag on longer than it should. I think Sucker Punch expected it to be more frantic like in the main story, but the difference is that there's other piles that you have to watch out for, and in here, it's just a one-on-one -on -one match so it's just hard to find each other. Powerhouse are also just broken, because if one player gets one, then the game just becomes completely unbalanced. Finally, there's Galleon Duel, and it's pretty fun when the other player actually knows what they're doing. Josh won one round, but meanwhile, I kept on destroying his ship every time, so it was pretty fun. For me. Overall, the multiplayer in this game could have been better, but they really needed some more time to polish some of the modes because you're better off just playing the cops and robbers and maybe by playing duel, but nothing else. I honestly wouldn't mind if they, they even made a multiplayer in the main game, maybe something like Sonic Heroes. Next, let's talk about the bosses, and they're uh, probably some of the hardest in the series. Or thing is that the first boss you fight in this game is one of two when you don't play as Sly. Donald Savio was a pretty cool boss, but his attack power can be pretty annoying to avoid. The Karma Larger fight was a little bit underwhelming to be honest. The first phase is you're just, just throwing bombs at her, and then the second phase you don't even fight her, you just swipe the mask off her face. Next we got the Black Baron, this boss is pretty tricky because you really need good reflexes to dodge this guy's punches and you can't afford to mess up at all. Now there's General Sal, and he's the best boss in the game. The first phase has you in the air and use your way to maneuver yourself while dodging his projectiles. Then you're on the ground trying to dodge his attacks. I love this boss, it's pretty tense. The boss with Lefui is, is probably the weakest out of the bunch because it's a little bit too easy, but I always forget what buttons to press when to strike him when he's distracted, but that's more because of me just pressing the wrong buttons at the wrong time than the boss actually being difficult. Finally, we have Dr. Rem and Sheesh. This guy seriously isn't fucking around because if you, if you mess up just once, this guy can just fucking launch your ass all the way to China with how hard he hits. I don't know how I was able to beat this game when I was 6 when this boss took me the longest to beat now that I'm 15. And probably the worst part about this boss is that every time you die, you have to listen to him say, You're as weak as your father. Every goddamn time. And you can't skip it either, so you have to watch this cutscene over and over again. And the weird thing about all of this is that it's honestly the best final boss in the series, since it's the only one that uses the series' core mechanics. 
but it doesn't make the boss any less harder. Also feel like I've been cheated working my ass off to beat this guy as Sly, yet it was way easier when I switched over to Carmelita. Like seriously, this boss took me over 30 minutes to beat as Sly, and then look how easily I beat this dude as Carmelita. No one hurt my criminal. Seriously, did they do this on purpose? They had to. This is the first Sly game that had many bosses. The first one's where you're chasing out Octavian on speedballs. The second is when you fight the big dingo after the bar fight, but I already talked about that, so let's move on to the mugshot fight with Carmelita. Again, since Carmelita's aim is a gargantuan, it's hard to miss mugshot. Then there's the Panda King where you enter his subconscious, but it's one for one the same battle from the first game, so I won't go over, over that again. Next is the Stone Giant that kidnaps Penelope, and it's pretty fun. Next we have the Crusher Squid boss, and it's a cool boss. The first phase has you play as the Panda King while you aim your shot at the tentacles to get him off his ship, and the second phase you play as Sly and get his tentacles stuck so it gets closer and you shoot Crusher straight in his eyes. And the last three bosses where you play as Carmelita to save Sly from a mutant monster, the only boss where you play as Dimitri, and the Dragonfly robot that you fight when you're in the biplane, all of them are pretty easy all things considered. But we still have one last thing to talk about and that's post game completion, but since this video has gone on longer than it had any right to, I'll try to keep this as brief as I can. You can replay missions now in Sly 3, and there's now a mode called the Master Thief challenges where you get to replay the missions but with some kind of condition like finishing missions in a certain amount of time, collecting a set amount of items before completing a mission, finishing a job with half health, and extra treasure hunting mission for each hub in that world too. I think this is the only Sly game that didn't feel like a complete chore to fully complete. I actually had fun doing all the Master Thief challenges in this game. Yeah, I had to do the Murray Turn mission with half health and the final boss in a time limit, but these didn't really frustrate me on the level like the Clue Balls in Sly 2 and the Master Thief Sprints in Sly 1. Honestly, I was just planning on doing a couple of missions to, just to get the footage, but honestly, I was having a lot more fun doing these than I thought I would. Doing it all unlocks some bonus movies, like this animated short called Goodbye My Sweet. It's about flying the game trying to steal an expensive chocolate bar that Kamali is trying to protect. Then we have the behind the scenes feature, but it's not really like the ones in the first and second games. It's more like a feature effort of missing Monaco level with Sly 2. And the other three fourths of the video spent with the developers cringing out older builds of Sly 1, and honestly, as they should. I'm really glad that Sly 1 came out as the game that it is today because, because those earlier prototypes look, look really rough. By the way, Bentley's voice in the first game was actually going to be a placeholder, but he just left it in because they just thought it was so funny. But, but was this really Kevin Miller's original Sly voice? That's Sly! Oh my gosh! My new climb move! Climb move! Oh! Man! Give her one like to punch the character in the face more. That would be it. Yeah! But what you get for 100% completion is a music video for Dimitri's theme song, and it's honestly the funniest thing I've ever seen. Dimitri on the mic with a shout out to all my nightclub samurai. Mmm, smooth. Keep it smooth, baby. Walk tall, stand tall, feel funky. Juice! Who's got the juice? The graphics in this game are almost identical to the last game, but I feel like out of the three games, Sly 3 has the best presentation in my opinion. The colors pop off so much more, the environments are more varied, and, and the attention to detail is so great, like the textures on the objects and the shadow details, and some of the more smaller details, like how levels change from day to night, or how whenever Sly swings his cane now, he has an aura around it. Whenever you hit a guard in this game, you really feel the impact of a hit, especially when you use one of the cane power-ups or any of the upgrades. There's also no place in this game that look too dark like in the first and second games. The shading doesn't go too overboard and the saturation still looks pretty great. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I feel like the characters look a little bit more expressive than before. I feel like the more emotional scenes hit hard without the character's emo, but I don't know if anyone else notices this, but I can't really tell if Sly's eyelids in some cutscenes were actually added there, or if there's on an eye graphic over where his eyes should be. I just thought that there was something in the HD collection, but no, the PS2 version has that too. And in one cutscene in episode 2, his entire character model just faces through the camera. And Murray's model before he joins the team again, his model still has the mask on, and they added a face paint texture over the mask, which just kind of looks lazy. I, I feel like it wouldn't take too much just to make a maskless model for him. I did run into a couple of frame rate issues, and even then it wasn't even that game breaking, so I won't hold that against the game. The animated cutscenes in this game are the best in the series. They don't look as static as the first game, and at the same time, they don't have any errors like Sly 2 had, like how in one cutscene, the animators gave Sly six fingers. Since I noticed this the first time I played the game, and now, I, and now I cannot notice it every time I start a new game. Does this mean that Sly is the real author of the journals? Is he Stanford's co-writer? And it was great to see how much the artist improved since the first game, because the art not only looks more refined, but the characters look more on model too. It doesn't feel like there are any restraints here, and it came out looking good. Overall, the graphics are some of the best looking in the series. 
Soundtrack is also pretty good too. Every song in this game is varied and it fits the theme of the, uh, the level that they're in. And the main theme was a pretty good remix of, the, of Sly 2's main theme. And again, they use it for the game's credits. I said this with Sly 2 and I'll say it again for Sly 3. I really wish Peter McConnell uh, composed an original piece for instead of reusing the same song. I mean, he did it for Sly 1 and it was great, so why not do the same for Sly 2 and 3? But the rest of the soundtrack is pretty good though. I think Sly 3 is about the best soundtrack in the series, and in my opinion, is one of the best PS2 soundtracks too. I mean, I, I mean, at this point, what else can I, what else can I say about Sly 3 that I haven't spent the last hour talking about? Like I said, I've already said out my favorite game in the trilogy like five times already, and after all, and after everything I, I've just talked about, I feel like you guys can get an idea of why. Okay, so I get that Sly 3 might not be the ideal Sly experience for everyone. I can get where people are coming from when they say that Sly 3 has too much stuff in it, and that they like Sly 2 better because it's more streamlined, but Sly 2 to me was a good game, but it felt like it was overstating its welcome sometimes, and it just got tedious after the 5th episode, since you're basically doing the same thing for 11 straight hours. Well, Sly 3, the extra content felt like they belonged there for the most part, because I didn't really feel like there was any part of the game where I felt like something didn't fit in the main idea of the episode. Every episode felt like the right amount of length, and again, nothing felt like it was dragging them on, I wasn't getting bored, I was entertained the whole way through, and I feel like the story helps with that too, because the character interactions, dialogue, writing, and the development are at their best here. Every character, including the villains, get their moments to shine, and the main trios are come full circle, and they all felt like they got their perfect ending. I honestly feel like Sly 3 just took all the issues I had with the first and second game and just fixed all in this game alone. It kind of sucks how this game didn't get as much praise as Sly 2 did back then, but it got a good enough press to be the end of the saga since this was the last game that Sucker Punch developed for the series, and this was a great way to go out on. And it's also pretty sad that this game sold a million less copies less than Sly 2, and since this was Sony's big platformer of 2005, that's really unfortunate. But I still really love Sly 3, it's my favorite game in the series. I feel like this is the game that really got me into Sly. I mean Sly 1 if it's a piece of the 2 might have helped out, but Sly 3 is definitely the game that made me as much of a hardcore Sly fan than I am a fan of either Sonic or Crash. Sometimes when I'm bored in class I just take out my sketchbook and just draw pictures of the characters because I've always loved how they look in the comic book animations, but whenever I'm quoting lines from the series, it's almost always from this game, and every time I play it, I keep finding new things about it to appreciate, and I feel like that's enough reason to call it one of my favorite PS2 games. And I get it, I love this game because I've been playing it for close to 10 years now, so I would obviously have a bias, so of course I would say that. But let's just say it's for someone who's just trying to get into the series and gets overwhelmed by all the different types of gameplay here, not only from the seven mission types, but also from the eight characters to play as. It might be too much for one player, so it's probably better to start with Sly 1, since this is the easiest to get into since it's a pretty basic platformer, or Sly 2, since Sly 3 uses the structure of that game. But if you play those games and you get into Sly 3, I really hope that you have, a, have just as much of a good time as I did, because, because this game is great no matter how many times I play, graphically is the best looking in the series and the story keeps me hooked with its characters and its themes, Sly 3 is just great. I have nothing else to add, go play Sly 3. In fact, just play the entire trilogy just in general, just like, either play on the original PS2 or play the PlayStation 3 remasters, or even emulate it on the on PCSS2, or even just emulate the remasters on RP, RP, RPCS3, just like, just play, just play the games, and I, and I hope to God that you have a good time, if you do, and for those of you who are wondering why I ranked this game between Jack 3 and Up Your Arsenal, I still, I still think Jack 3 has the weakest third game between the, between the three series, but I, I, but I can't really decide if I like Sly 3 better or uh, Ratchet & Clank 3 better, so I, I feel like I'm, I might have to play Up Your Arsenal again, just to, just to decide. But we still have one more game. Of, but we still have one more game to look at before this marathon ends, and it's considered the worst game in the series by most fans. And like, I'm actually kind of, I'm actually kind of, I'm actually kind of decided to do this video because um, actually, because I, I I normally defend this game from the hate that it gets, but I, this is actually the first time that I'm actually like fully completing this game since my first playthrough back in 2017. So you know, I'm kind of excited to see what I would think about the game now, and I'm of course I'm of course talking about Sly Cooper Thieves in time. So yeah, let's wait until that video comes out. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.